we live? Yep, you're live. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to join you on this virtual expo. Uh, every year I come to the physical expo, so it's kind of very uh, disappointing not to be there, but really exciting to actually have something to replace it. Uh, and I'm, uh, as a regular attendee and also a game developer, um, this is kind of an exciting thing to be part of. And I'm really, really pleased to be joined by um, some guests to chat with you uh, what I hope will be a very illuminating hour on the subject of Mars and games about Mars. Uh, I'll introduce my, myself very briefly and then two of our, my three guests, the third of whom is uh, hopefully joining us any moment now. Uh, so my name is Dr. Thomas Rawlings. I run Auroc Digital and I was part of the development team that made uh, Mars Horizon Blast Off and currently working on a digital version of that Mars Horizon. Uh, and I am really delighted to be joined by Cyan Proctor, Dr. Cyan Proctor, uh, and Paul Smith from the UK Space Agency. So, uh, Cyan, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself and your general interest in this area, and 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 then the same, Paul, that would be amazing. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Cyan Proctor, and I live in Phoenix, Arizona, and I am a geoscience professor at a community college here. I've been teaching geology for about 21 years, but I'm also an analog astronaut. That's why I have my flight suit on today. So I like to live in moon and Mars simulations. An analog astronaut is somebody who engages in human space flight research and training, but here on earth. And so I've lived in the high seas habitat twice um, and I might be going back again in the fall. That's amazing. It would be good to chat a little bit more about that um, shortly after we've done the intros. I'd love to hear more about that. Uh, and Paul? Hi, I'm Paul Smith. I am Robotic Exploration Program Manager for the UK Space Agency. So I um, help to run our exploration program to planets like Mars and to the Moon as well. Um, and so I've been heavily involved in the um, European and Roscosmos ExoMars project, which we talk about in a bit. And I'm also hoping at any moment to be joined by Jacob, who's the designer of um, Terraforming Mars. Um, so hopefully he will pop in at some point, in which case I will get him to introduce himself. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, just a little bit of getting into it. Uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're both kind of very heavily involved in the actual uh, exploration, science and research around Mars. Uh, games on Mars, are you a fan of gaming and games and which ones do you enjoy? Uh, yeah, I, I really, I, I've always liked games. Um, unfortunately, in the last couple of years, I haven't been able to play as much. My my best friend, who is also likes playing board games, moved away. And so she now lives in like Denmark. And <laughs> so the, my, my go-to gamer is no longer with me for board games and card games. But whenever we do get together, we play a variety of games. Um, and funny enough, I actually had never played any of the Mars games with her, but we play a bunch of different board games uh, and card games and, and, and sometimes in the habitat. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, so if you're doing, if you're kind of, if you're imagining like being stuck on a, a simulation of, you know, as you, as you do, you know, something either traveling to Mars or being on Mars, what role what, is, could games play a practical role in keeping people entertained? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, it, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I was part of the very first crew to live in the high seas habitat. And there were a couple of the of my crewmates who were really into playing more of the digital games, the, um, you know, online shooting games and things like that. And so they would be up late into the night playing those kinds of games. Because one of the things is that you've got to kind of stay mentally stimulated and having things that you enjoy, whether it's reading, um, arts and crafts, cooking, anything that can kind of keep you st stimulated during that time. So I lived in the high seas habitat for four months investigating food strategies for long duration space flight. So four months, you got to do something. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm trying to think what is a really long game now, because there's a few games that are famous, like they take days to play it. And normally that's a bit of a like, when would you ever get that time? But I guess potentially, or do, do you get much free time when you're in that habitat? Or is, is there a kind of constant rotor of stuff you need to be on? 
We, we have a pretty full schedule, but um, we usually at the end of the day, we would come together after the uh, meal and chat and hang out um, if we didn't have anything extra we had to do. But Friday nights was movie night. So we would do that. And then on Sundays was kind of your day to, to, to do whatever you wanted to do, whether it was to catch up on some work that you still had to do or just relax. And, and you know, this is a 900 square foot dome. So there are times when you just want to get away too. So you got to yeah. go into your little room <laughs> yeah. and, and get some alone time. Yeah. But gaming or games is a really good way to build crew cohesion and um, and just get to know each other and sit around the table and do things. And so very important. Excellent. Um, Paul, yourself, uh, what games do you enjoy then? Yeah, I, I play quite a few games. I err more on the strategy side of things, but, um, including space related ones, I guess, like Stellaris and Surviving Mars and things like that, but as well as um, board games and um, yeah, all sorts really. Um, I haven't got a isolation dome to play in, unfortunately, so it's much harder to do things in the current climate with friends and family and so on. But, um, well, you'd be good. Um, what I was wondering, like, because looking through, I mean, when I was doing the research for the, for both, you know, for Mars Horizon Blast Off and and for the stuff in general, there's there's I realised there's a lot of games that there's a lot. Obviously, there's a lot of games that are about space and science fiction. That that's a huge topic for games, unsurprisingly. But there's a surprisingly large amount where Mars plays quite a big role in in the game, uh, and and you know, I'm talking the whole gamut from say. The Warhammer 40,000 stuff where Mars is kind of big narratively and represents a faction to it or like our own game where it's it's more about the kind of the, the first point at us becoming a, a multiplanetary species. I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Proctor, why, why do you think we're so fascinated by Mars? I mean, you know, it, it seems to loom large in the culture. You know, what, why Mars? Why not? Why, why have we not got the same amount of stuff about some of the other planets? Well, you know, that's a really good question. But um, one of the things is when we looked up um, at the night sky from hundreds of years ago to thousands of years ago, one of the things is really looking at the patterns in the night sky and figuring out, you know, what was stars and what were planets and the planets that we could see. And so when we're thinking about that, Venus comes very prominent in that, in that, and so does Mars. And so as we started to look at both of those, Mars was always very interesting because of the, the red planet and what did that represent and what did it mean? Um, and so also it, its orbit, it does some interesting things. And, and so we've always been fascinated by it, but we really became even more fascinated by it when we started to be able to look at it through um, telescopes and, and starting to think about what uh, some of the features, even though fuzzy, what would that mean? Um, are there people there? Are they, are, are they moving water through canals? And so that really fueled our imagination. And so um, you can just imagine how the speculation of Martians came along and then the visitation of, of aliens to Earth and where that, that narrative plays in sci-fi. And as a result of that, it, as we got to know Venus as being, which is really more size-wise and everything Earth-like, but once we realized that ah, it's you know burning hot and <laughs> a ridiculous amount of pressure, we really kind of turned and focused a lot more on what Mars can offer and um, thinking beyond moon, where would the next logical step be? And that of course is Mars for humans. I mean, which is a good jumping off point to talk, uh, to ask you Paul a little bit about um, your work because uh, you know, you're involved in a mission that's going up to Mars very shortly. Uh, I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the UK Space Agency is part of the European Space Agency, and in conjunction with Roscosmos, we've the, the Russian Space Agency, and um, we have been building here in Britain the Rosalind Franklin rover, mm -hmm. part of the overall ExoMars program, and that's really sending Europe's first rover to the Martian surface, and it will be the first 
one that's able to dig beneath the surface, which is where we think that we could find signs of past or present life. It's got this amazing foldable drill that can extend up to two meters below the surface, which is where it should be anything like life or microbes or bacteria should be protected by Martian soil above it from radiation, for instance. So it's, it's the first mission that's going to be, that is really specifically for searching for life. And it's in conjunction with a satellite that's already there, um, the Trace Gas Orbiter, and that's looking at um, the different sorts of gases in the Martian atmosphere, because the Martian atmosphere is very thin, much thinner than Earth's atmosphere. So, and it has almost no oxygen. It's carbon dioxide heavy, it's about 1% the density of Earth's. But within that, there could be different um, gases that are the signs of life. For instance, methane, that's a big one. So that's a byproduct of a lot of bacteria that we have on Earth. And so if we can find um, trace elements of methane in Mars atmosphere, that could be a good indication that there is active life on Mars. Unfortunately, it sounds like you're nodding along in that, and I know this is an area of interest of yours as well. I, I mean, what's that? What, and before we jump into the games bit more, what, what's your uh, as a geologist? You know, does, is it this sort of super exciting stuff of what what the ExoMars mission is going to be able to do? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I think everybody is really excited about um, the potential for finding life uh, on Mars. And, you know, just what does that mean, and and <laughs> what significance does it mean in terms of where did life start first, too? And um, it's the it's kind of that golden question of is it unique and it started on Mars and then hopped over to Earth or are these independent and um, and how similar will it be then if they're if it's we're talking about life de uh, developing independently in two locations and I'm excited. I hope they figure <laughs> this one out in my lifetime. Uh, you know those are two things that I would really like to see uh, in my lifetime is boots on Mars and uh, the second one is evidence of life, out, you know, outside of Earth. I mean, uh, we've had a couple of questions in the chat, um, which uh, I was going to come to now. But but just before we jump into that, but as I've got two people deeply enmeshed in this area, what do you think our chances of finding evidence of life on Mars are? I mean, are they, you know, reasonable? Um, yeah, I mean, like, would be so, yeah. What, what, what's your guesstimate? It's, it's difficult, we just don't know. Um, we're sending Rosalind Franklin to where we think is a likely place. It's a, um, what looks to be a ancient riverbed. Um, so we know on earth that everywhere there is water, there is life. So if the same is true for somewhere like Mars, then looking at where there was water in its prehistory is definitely the best place to look. So yeah, from that point of view, we're definitely um, doing as much as we can to increase the likelihood, but the, the samples that we're taking and the, the amount of like distance that you can travel is small in comparison to mm -hmm. the size of the planet overall. Um, I really hope that we are able to find something and we get you know, very lucky, but even if we don't find concrete proof, there's still plenty of things that we can use to infer and um, learn about the Martian surface and its history anyway. Um, yeah, that, that's, if it doesn't find life, that's not, um, not a failure. It's just- That's, that's life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. More questions that need to yeah. be answered, so. Uh, Okay, brilliant. Jacob's just about to join us. Yeah, uh, uh, Cyan, so yeah, what, what, your, what your thoughts, possibilities of getting, um, finding something there? Got a you rough know, idea? Well, I think that, uh, you know, Paul is, is correct that size-wise and what we've been able to explore has is very small. I think when we can actually get humans there, a human can do so much more than a, a robotic rover, but the robotic rover lays the groundwork 
for us to understand how to survive on, in such a hostile environment um, and, and gives us clues as to the history, the development, where to think about putting the first settlement and all of those things. And so, um, you know, finding life there would be great, but I, you know, let's be honest, if we're gonna find life, let's find intelligent life. <laughs> let's get a signal that says, hey, we're here. Yeah. Uh, well, Jacob, uh, great that you've joined us. Um, uh, yeah, I just wondered if you did you want to introduce yourself and uh, your work um, to the stream. That would be amazing. And if you, uh, yeah, can you hear me? You can hear you just about. You might need to speak up a little. Uh, okay, is this better? Uh, yeah. Right. Um, so I'm not uh, sure where I'm. <laughs> where I'm oh yeah, there we go. Uh, all right. So. Uh, um, yeah, so I'll tell you about myself first, right? So I'm yeah. Jacob Curtis, and um, uh, I design board games, and the most famous one is uh, Terraforming Mars. And uh, it's, um, uh, we worked for it on it for quite a few years before releasing it in 16, uh, and it's of course about Terraforming Mars, and uh, it uh, it fits very well with my background as a science. Uh, doctor of chemistry, but also science teacher. And I've always been fascinated by Mars and science and so on. So I was very happy to, to be able to bring uh, all my uh, knowledge in different areas together in planetology. And this way, I've, uh, I've always been fascinated by space and, and so on. Uh, but I just chose a more, uh, more down-to-earth uh, career for, in, in science to begin with. And now I have board games, which is marvelous too. Hmm. Thank you for that. Um, we, we've had a couple of questions in chat and uh, I think it'd be interesting to just get people's thoughts on, on this one. So one, somebody has pinged in uh, and I think, you know, it'd be interesting. Uh, so what do we think the common mistake people make when they think about living on Mars? Because a lot of the games that uh, I looked at, you know, uh, obviously it's in terraforming Mars that people are living on Mars, say games like On Mars or First Martians, you've got, uh, or Pocket Mars, you've got people living on Mars. What What are the mistakes that you think people make when they imagine living on Mars? Uh, and, and I wonder if, uh, yeah, uh, Sion, you want to take that start and then Jacob and then Paul? Sure. I, you know, having lived in Mars simulations, uh, I think one of the big ones is, uh, you know, they deal with the technical aspect, which is the food, water, energy, air, you know, those are all the technical things that we have to overcome, which is great. But there is so much psychology in this that is rarely addressed. Uh, and so crew cohesion, how you get along, and, and then also the culture we're leaving behind, it will be the furthest that humans have gone away from earth and what does that mean? Um, and, and how do you deal with that because of the stress, just the journey out there, and, but then living there and without the prospect of coming back and, and it's not like going, you know, when we um, have migrated around the, the world here on earth, because when you migrate on earth, you have all of the similarities of the place you left behind. You have trees and you have air you can breathe and you have water and you have all of these things that are familiar. And so going to Mars psychologically, boy, we're talking barren, um, hostile and 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 deadly, so psychology that's, that's is good. something. I mean, did, did that psychology come in when you were designing terraforming Mars? And obviously, you, you're thinking about larger, larger masses of people in, in the way that the game works. Does the psychology of of what that that emergent cultures sort of spring into your mind, Jacob, when you were designing the game? Um, as you said, I think it. I, the game takes a little bit bigger perspective. Personally, I, I think there, if there is a challenge, there will always be people up to the challenge, which just, uh, I mean, Mars One hasn't done so well so far, but they had so many applicants, so many people are interested to go and, and are also willing to endure this, this kind of psychological uh, endeavor. Uh, but one thing that I, I would like to say, which 
people have objected that we can't go to Mars because of gravity and so on. Uh, and just related to, to Seal's uh, uh, comment about prospects of not going back, because uh, the astronauts uh, have, of, of course, the bone, bone mass loss uh, when they are in zero gravity. And of course, that would happen uh, as well to a, to a certain degree on Mars because it's lower gravity. But the thing is, if you don't go home, in the environment which your body has adapted to. And it's very difficult, I think, to adapt back to Earth, uh, to Earth standards or Earth uh, situation. But if you say it's not, I don't expect it to be such a big problem that people think when they hear, hear these uh, problems with astronauts and zero-g gravity. Zero gravity. Uh, so that's just one interesting uh, discussion that I've had with people. Your thoughts on it, Paul? Um, yeah, uh, psychology is definitely um, going to be a a very important factor for the first sort of people who who are living there on a permanent basis, for instance. Um, coming back is if you've um, been in a low gravity environment for an extended period of time, like the most um, one person has remained in space at a time is a year. Um, if you're talking about going to Mars, that's um, at least seven months there. You've got to have you know, a bit of time on Mars. You've got to then, if you are coming back, you've got to go up into orbit around Mars, wait for the right um, time to come back where the planets align, so to speak, but um, in order to make the most efficient journey back you're talking at least um, 21 months more, you know, before you're able to um, set foot on Earth again. And at that point, you know, we just don't know how much um, that will affect the human body. You know, we're, we're discovering more and more about how much things like bone mass are, are affected, but also the shape of your eyeballs changes in low gravity. You know, it's, there's so many more things that we just don't know get taller by about two inches as your spine, the fluid in your spine expands. You know, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff that we don't know. So anyone that you know, lives on Mars is likely to be living on Mars for the rest of their life. You know? But I think that's um, a lot of the thing that people underestimate about games and things is, is the time it takes to get there and the time it will take to set something up. Like it's not going to be a case of in um, games where you plop your first little settlers down for, you know, there's about four or five of them, and then suddenly next month you get a whole load more. It's going to be a, a long, slow process over years before you can even have more than, say, one habitat facility, let alone, you know, an entire city. It's going to be a, a long-term investment by anyone who, who wants to go. Well, well, that I think that's a kind of good segue into the idea of terraforming Mars. And uh, what will be interesting to chat to is is a little bit of your thinking, Jacob, in the create. Because obviously, you know, when I play terraforming Mars, it feels like a game that has that longer term view of it's not happening quickly, um, as as Paul talked to. But I'm interested in both. Um, yeah, your thinking on on seeing the arc of of how that play would 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 progress and then also dr proctor and paul uh the you know what are the realities of terraforming mars i mean we, we're talking about how difficult it is just to get people out there now now we're talking about getting some pretty heavy machinery out there to start doing something so starting with you jacob yeah what what was the kind of thinking and research you did in in thinking of that as as, as the long-term narrative of mars yeah I think terraforming for sure is a long-term project and how long-term it, it would be if it's even successful or what to what degree it would be successful because we can't really tell right now uh, but uh, yeah uh, it, it's for sure a, a long-term one and uh, for me since i'm not really an expert in, in many of the areas involved uh, i've uh, i've done some research research of course but 
but uh, the ideas for something the game are more like an overview to get to people to see, okay, what kind of thing could you do? Uh, you could do this, how would that work approximately? And so on, and you can do this and that and so on. Uh, so it's, it's more of, it, it's not a, a very scientific simulation. But there are, I would, I would call it a, a scientific expose of ideas. Uh, what could happen, how, could, how it could uh, be done, or what kind of method you, you might consider. And maybe some work, maybe some don't work, uh, but that's not the, the point. The point is there is a lot that we can try and do. And I think uh, there are two things uh, that make me a bit optimistic. Uh, and the first is print, uh, 3D printing. You don't really need to bring machinery from Earth because you can print uh, spare parts and so on and so on on site. You just have to figure out the materials, the science first, and the advance the printers a bit more, and then you can use it for quite a lot of things. I I, I think so. That is, I think, one of the main uh, steps towards colonizing. Actually, with a three D printer, I think it, it's so it's so key to colonizing. To, to create the colonize. The other thing is scientific progress. I mean, we have our science now, but it will not stop progressing. There will be more science we discover. There will be more methods to, to, to try out, no new materials that we create in 10 years. And who knows? I mean, look, look at the development for the last 100 years. If you extrapolate that and have just as much development the next 100 years, it doesn't seem so impossible mm -hmm. anymore. And the next hundred years after that, and the next hundred years after that. I mean, uh, today's science, of course, it would be extremely difficult. Uh, and also a third one, I can't really count, I suppose, but uh, there's a third reason, and that is robotics. Uh, in, in Stanley Robinson's uh, book, Red Mars, uh, one of the key factors is using robots that actually create new robots. So you, as long as you figure out how to use resources, you can make robots that make more robots that work for you. And, uh, and then you don't have need uh, these uh, really big masses of, of people to do these things. You don't need, but it, it opens up a lot of possibilities. And that's, that's, no, that's a really good point. I could see, Sian, that you wanted to jump in there and then Paul, we could get your thoughts as well as, as head of Robotics, <laughs> UK Space Agency. I'm sure. Yeah. So, what, what were your you, what were your thoughts, Sian? Oh, no, I loved everything that you said, Jacob, because it it is um, a long term goal, and some of the things that we can do uh, with robotics and uh, the exponential technology growth that we're we're to some extent we're experiencing, and so it would. To some extent, you could predict what was going to be 5, 10, 15 years down the road. But now with the digital technology and the kind of things that we're seeing happening, that number, you know, if you say, well, what's it going to be like 20 years from now? Oh, well, um, but we can send robots there and do the some of the technology, the work now that we want. And as we get better at it, it, you know, landing things in the elliptical spot that we want them to be and setting up and having robots be able to go and sample how to do a 3D print ahead of time and, and pulling some of that regolith and, and looking at the, the material. And, and so that's what I think when, when Paul's going to talk, he's going to talk a lot about that whole idea of how we can use technology before we even get to Mars, before we send humans to Mars, how do we set ourselves up for success? And, and, and from the human side, what we can do here is we can do some of the training um, and, and get ourselves prepared. I mean, you could look at it this way. If we wanted to simulate going to Mars to some extent, we could send people up to the ISS they live there for a year as if they were traveling to Mars, you know, nine months. They come back to Earth and they pop right into the high seas and see if they can do anything <laughs> like um, and how can they function like and you can put them through the test of trying to do some of the things that you would want them to do for that year or two. 
um, as a crew. And then yeah, pop them back up to the ISS and then have them hang out there <laughs> again for six months and then bring them back. And you know, the, the par problem with gravity is not you know, uh, taken care of because we'd be coming back to Earth's gravity, but at least it would give us an idea of psychology and function and all of those kinds of things before actually sending humans. Yeah, so uh, robotics is, is definitely going to be one of the primary ways of figuring all of this stuff out. Um, NASA's Perseverance ro rover that's heading heading to Mars as we speak, it has a, uh, an instrument on board called MOXIE, and that's designed to um, use the Martian soil, or regolith as it's known, um, and extract oxygen from it. And this could be used to you know, um, provide air for habitats, for instance, or fuel for rockets for you to get off the Martian surface if you suddenly decide that you don't want to be there anymore. Um, so there's, there's ways that we're already testing how to use these, these resources that already exist. As like Jacob said, you know, it's, it's going to be too much to send machinery from Earth to Mars to do everything for us. We're going to have to be able to, to build stuff there. And so, so determining what resources already exist there and how we can use them is, is why we're sending a lot of rovers. You know, they're, they're paving the way for for human exploration. Um, we, we don't know enough about the, the Martian surface to, to know whether we'll be able to extract, say, iron, one of the most important metals for um, building in, in space or, or anywhere. You know, iron or um, aluminium, uh, copper, these are all like important materials for, for electronics as well. Is if you're talking about using robots to build robots, well, you need a ready supply of copper wiring, you need silicon transistors to be able to make microchips. You know, uh, the um, mobile phones and laptops that you know, we're using to communicate now are fantastically complicated and have all of these different metals that come from different places on Earth. And, being able to find all of them in the right places, easily accessible on the Martian surface to be able to do things like that is it's going to be challenging. But all of the, the mapping that we're doing now, you know, that that's that's why making our lives easier in the future. You know, it's we'll jump here with a couple more questions. That, that's a good kind of point because in fact uh, I went to I was very kindly invited to STEC, so one of ESA's sites. Uh, and they had some of the regolith 3D printed test stuff in, in one of the areas there, which is really amazing to see. The other thing that I found really inspiring about being there, and we were doing work on research on Mars Horizon, so I got to chat with you know some some other uh, some of your colleagues there on, on the Exo Mars and things like that, was it was just really inspiring being in this place that was slightly Star Trek-y in that there's a whole bunch of very smart people there from all over the world who had all come together with this mission to help us to understand space. And it was just really, really inspiring. Uh, and, and for me, like we've tried to kind of pour some of that inspiration back into the games that we make. I mean, what do you think the role that, that games have both in terms of inspiring people to want to do this and also in almost setting like, you know, imagination targets for where we as a, as a species could be. And I, I know, uh, Cyan, this is something you're very interested in. So yeah, I was just want to uh, uh, sign your thoughts on this and then, and then Paul and Jacob, if you want to jump in after that. You know, I, I, that's one of the things that's really interesting when we're talking about moon and Mars and, colon, and uh, settlements and, and even the language we use, right? Um, colonization versus settlements and what are the best of humanity that we want to bring to forward? And if we are we striving for that Star Trek kind of idea versus Star Wars? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to trek across the solar system or do you want to fight your way across the solar system? And and so this whole idea of, of being inspired through games and through the science fiction that we read and, and all of the technology, because it's it, humans, our imagination is what fuels the future and inspires people like me and Jacob and, and you guys as 
to become scientists and, and to create games and to do these things. Um, and so it's really important because I remember as a kid, you know, playing games with my family and, um, and thinking about, wow, what, what if this really existed? And, and, or how, how do we make this a reality? And so when I think of people playing Transforming Mars, they are getting inspired and the imagination, you don't know what kids are thinking, wow, I really want to figure out how to do this piece of technology that Jacob has, you know, put into the game. And, and that person may turn out be able to do that in the future. And so, and so I, I love a lot of the elements that are, are being brought in through gaming to inspire us to just think about the future and what can be, um, and us being the designers of our, our future to some extent. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about going to the moon and Mars is our, you know, going someplace and actually designing the future that we want to have and the, the type of society we want to live in. And I think that that's something that um, is not necessarily always taken into account in some of the games that we are talking about, but definitely it's taken into account in some of the science fiction that we read and, uh, and the TV and movies that we see. Yeah, I think um, you're exactly right, Sam. Um, games and, and films and books are all there to help inspire the next generation of, of people who, you know, the, these are the ones who will be living and working on Mars in the future, perhaps, you know. Um, yes, so fingers well, crossed. <laughs> yes, fingers crossed, definitely. I mean, the, in the UK, um, we have about 46,000 people in the aerospace industry, and that's not enough for, you know, sending people to Mars and beyond. You know, we need, we always need more engineers, but also more scientists, more lawyers, administrators, artists, entertainers, we need all of these in order to you know, make something like settlement of Mars a reality, right? We always need more people. And inspiring the, the next generation is such an important part of the UK Space Agency, let alone, you know, the future of, of science and engineering, as we know it. I mean, we, we need um, people to work in, in all different areas. There's, there's always somewhere that people can, can work in the space industry. I think that's, that's something that games are in particular good at highlighting because you're a games designer, but you're here talking to scientists and um, people from space agencies and so on about living on Mars. You, know? it's, you can be involved wherever you are whatever you do. And I think mm. that's a really important lesson that, that we should pass on to future generations. Definitely. Um, I don't know if you want to jump in on that one, Jacob, but if not, we've got other questions pinging in. Just a uh, short, uh, I think being an inspiration is very important to me as a science teacher as well. So that was the, one of the main goals for, for making this game. And we were really happy about it. We also wanted, just to connect back to Sian's point, uh, we also wanted an optimistic future, a scientific and optimistic future. And uh, I, I really hope to inspire people. I mean, so many games are dystopic because it's more than uh, 10 or something. Uh, but we wanted this to be an optimistic game and uh, I'm really happy about that. Mm. Well, on uh, one of the things, and uh, this came up in a question, and um, one of the things that I, I thought it's kind of raised is, is this discussion we had about that once people go to Mars, then the difference in the gravity levels and how that might happen, and also just the sheer the sheer difficulty of getting people back is going to make it more likely that it's a one way trip once you you know, once you settle on Mars. Um, how long do you think it will be before we end up with? our own Martian culture like you know humans we've got a lot as uh, you, you mentioned it Sian, we've got a lot of experience of people migrating around within the planet and you know we, we it's a, there's a big dialogue obviously going on now around how people who move to a different society what do they what do they retain of their existing culture what do they pick up of a newer culture they're in what what kind of blending and, and interesting new 
cultures are developed in, in that kind of point. How will that happen when it's not just cultures between moving around between countries or continents, but actual planets? You know, will we? How long before we'll end up with with a Martian culture? Do you think? You know, that is a really good question. I think the big one is we have to overcome the the survival. And what what I mean by that is that we can send people there, but if they can't, uh, you know reproduce successfully on Mars, if we can't get humans to reproduce there successfully, then, you know, <laughs> we just keep sending them there to die. And so that's the big hurdle is, is well, yeah, we can send humans to Mars, but can you successfully bring a baby to term and deliver it on Mars, and what does that mean? A healthy, you know, a healthy baby, and then have that baby develop into a healthy human being. And and if, not, if we can't overcome that, then what does that mean for for future generations? And and how do we potentially offset that through technology? Right, because a lot of times when we talk about humans going off and populating not only our solar system but potentially beyond, we often think of it as ourselves the way we are now. But that doesn't mean that that's the most successful form of humanity to exist outside of Earth. And so maybe it is some kind of combination of you know human genetics and technology. Um, that enables us to move on in the future. We just don't know. But you, it's hard to speculate when we'll get that cultural thing back if we can't, if we can't overcome that hurdle of reproduction. Interesting. Um, on, uh, we had a question popping as well, more on the terraforming Mars end of. So in terraforming Mars, um, corporations are kind of quite a key part of the game uh, was something you could talk to Jacob and, and, and the question was really to what role do we see the, the, the kind of the difference between government based research and exploration and private companies in that because obviously it's been a, a fairly big jump in the, certainly the prominence of private companies over the last few years so yeah starting with you Jacob I mean was that was that a conscious thought on your part when you thought of the terraforming of Mars that it would be corporations and not necessarily countries doing it? Yeah, um, me and my brothers in the company, we have discussed this uh, quite a lot and uh, we think it's, uh, it seems likely that it will be big corporations driving this mainly in the future. Of course, nations will be, uh, will be involved as well, as well. But uh, in timeline, I mean, I mean, like in 300 years, I think a lot of will have changed. And I think as we see globalization, I mean, most young people on the planet speak English, even if it's not their native native tongue. And uh, so I think I think uh, this globalization means that nations, as as it were, will be less important, and economic interest will be more important. Uh, I think also that it is because political uh, political influence, which has driven uh, space flight so far, more than economic interests, it's very fickle. I mean, you have an election and you have a new president and then uh, the policy will change. So, uh, so you cannot really depend on it uh, long term and uh, you cannot depend on it to, to actually drive it forward. You need to have a long term ec economic interest or political interest, but political interests are never, never long, <laughs> uh, long term. Uh, as far as I can see, so I, I think it will it will end up in the in the corporations, mostly. Um, Paul, I know that the UK Space Agency obviously has an interest in the UK developing a private space industry. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, it's something as big as terraforming or settling Mars, for instance. That's, that's a question that um, legally governments have to talk about. Um, as numerous treaties related to um, governing space objects, for instance, no one can claim a section of the moon, um, but then certain, certain countries haven't signed these treaties. 
Yeah, so it's it's going to be a case of of the whole world uniting to to solve the like legal implications of stuff, um, let alone uh, how we deal with private industry and um, their plans for things. But in terms of, of terraforming, for instance, we need to think of the ethical implications of um, potentially destroying um, the natural environment of Mars. Um, even if there is no life there, we'd be destroying um, you know, countless volcanoes and riverbeds and valleys and so on that have lasted for billions of years. You know, do, we, do we have that right to um, just sweep everything under the rug and start again? Um, if, if there is life there, would us and our involvement in um, melting ice caps or uh, thickening the atmosphere and pumping CO2 into it, how much would that affect indigenous life? Um, you know, we, we need to, to study all of this beforehand before we get to the point where um, companies are competing for space on Mars. You know, we, there's a lot of groundwork that we need to cover first before we get to um, the question of governments versus private enterprise. But... Yeah. Um, Sina, do you, if you wanted to come in on that topic of the private public governmental question of Mars and well, who owns Mars? <laughs> I, I think the, the moon is going to be the test bed. <laughs> I mean, for everything that we're going to be able to do on Mars, we're going to be going back to the moon is the right choice uh, because the, and we're going to be kind of, to some extent, duking it out there and figuring out how to uh, create, a, you know, a habitat and put people there and do some of these things. And it's not saying that we won't try to do Mars at the same time, but the moon is one of the ones where uh, resources and doing some of the technical things that will enable us to be more successful at Mars will happen there. And that involves private corporations and right now private corporations and the government working together, but not worldwide to some extent. I mean, we've had the International Space Station and that's been very successful to some extent, but you know, it still doesn't include everybody. And when we're talking about space being just, equitable, um, diverse and inclusive, those four big ones, hasn't been that way so far. <laughs> so it, it's, I think there's a lot to, a lot of discussion that needs to happen. And really, it's, again, it's our opportunity to make those choices and they are choices and, and we live with the consequences. We've got, um, thank you for that. We've got six minutes now um, before we're finishing up. So I thought what would be um, good would be just a quick shoot round of where, where can people find out more about um, each of you and your work? Um, uh, so yeah, start, uh, starting with you, Paul, uh, where can people find out more about ExoMars and the work that you're doing in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, the next step in getting us to Mars? So for ExoMars and Rosalind Franklin, you want to go to the ESA website. I think it's ESA.org. Um, but also we have our own website as part of the .gov.uk um, system. So you can, you can search for all of these on your favorite um, search engines. And, but we also have a Twitter feed at UK Space. That's our, the UK Space Agency's official um, Twitter where we um, provide the latest news and announcements and so on to, with the UK space industry as a whole. And when's ExoMars going up again? ExoMars, Rosalind Franklin Rover will be heading up in two years time in uh, July, August of 2022. Exciting. Uh, and Cyan, yeah, where can people find out more about you and your work? Uh, first of all, I just want to say um, I love the name of the the rover. Thank yes, you. Um, should, um, should, I, I just kind of applause that, <laughs> and and so and all that you're doing there. And uh, Jacob, I want to just say 
Terraforming Mars, fantastic. Um, and the, the, what you're doing. And I love the fact that you're inspired. You're a teacher, you're a science teacher inspired to bring space to the world and, and through gaming. And, and Thomas, the same one for you for doing that also. Oh, uh, I, I love it. And so I'm at Dr. Siam Proctor. And so you can, that's on Twitter, it's on mm. Instagram, it's on Facebook. Um, you can Google me. There's only one. <laughs> we, we and then actually, you can, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, interesting, it's just come up on the chat. Uh, one of the people who are watching now actually suggested the name of Rosalind Franklin uh, and was actually at the naming ceremony wow. for yes. these things. So that's great. Um, uh, and, and then Jacob, yeah, where can people find your work and more about what you're up to? You're on mute at the moment, Jacob. So if you're talking, you might need to click the thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, our website is fricksgames.se uh, where we have our different games that we have released and, uh, and news about uh, those things. And of course, you can sign up to a newsletter there. And if you want to even be behind the scenes a bit, we have a Patreon page as well. Uh, so fricksgames.se uh, would be the start. Brilliant. Uh, and, and our work, you can find at aurochdigital.com and we're on Twitter at aurochdigital. Uh, and um, yeah, we, we've got a lot more uh, Mars-based content coming up as we gear towards the launch of um, uh, Mars Horizon, the PC version, well, PC and console version of that. Um, just as we finish then, as we've got a couple of minutes, um, do you want to pick up, uh, Cyan, why the name Rosalind Franklin is so interesting and why that's such an exciting name? Um, yeah, sure. I think that when we're talking about, again, diversity and inclusion um, and the things that people have gone uh, and done in the past and haven't necessarily gotten, gotten the recognition for their achievements or their contributions, women uh, in particular have had issues with that. People of color have had issues with that. And so when we want to go into space. And again, when I think of those, the big four, I call it the Jedi space, because it's just, uh, so if you want to remember this, you know, it's about being just equitable, diverse and inclusive. And how do you get that Jedi space? And things like this, people are gonna Google her and they're gonna be like, wait, why did they name it that? And, <laughs> and, then, and then she'll be known. And, and so I just, I love that. Um, representing the people from the past, but also elevating the, the people of the future when we're talking about diversity and inclusion. And so thank you for having me here. Well, thank you. Because uh, Rosalind Flankin, I'm right in thinking she was uh, the crystallographer who did some incredibly complicated technical work to take photos of DNA that right. actually was the underpinning of the, you know, the more famous Watson and Crick's discovery of the structure of it, but without her work to photograph it, to give them the images to ponder, yeah. we wouldn't exactly. know, yeah, we wouldn't know DNA. Uh, so I actually ran the naming competition. Ah, there we go. Over, and, and that's, um, we received, over 36,000 entries to the competition. And as part of the panel, we all felt that Rosalind Franklin was, was the standout candidate for the reasons that you're saying, you know, she was a pioneer in her field. Um, some say, you know, she, she was been sidelined over her contributions and forgotten that she's contributed to the, the entire field of X-ray crystallography, owes her a, a great debt. and many of the scientific discoveries that we have now are linked directly to her and so it is it's you know our honor to to name a rover after her and to somewhat fortunately and unfortunately be the first um nation to have a um rover named after a woman brilliant well uh we have few seconds left so i just want to thank uh thank you all for taking the time to join the panel i hope everybody's found it really interesting i believe we'll get a video of this at the end so we'll post it up online afterwards um uh we'll certainly pop it up on our twitter and everything like that and thank you to the uh uk games expo for hosting us uh and and again yeah thank you all for coming along and watching and uh i uh, hope you have a rest of the good virtual conference thank you thank you thanks everyone